So the goal of this talk is to explain to you what these things mean, univalent foundations and what the equivalence principle is. Um, what is the equivalence principle? It's an informal principle uh, which says that reasoning in mathematics should be invariant under the appropriate notion of, well, equivalence. And what is the appropriate notion of equivalence? Well, that depends on the objects that we consider. So if we consider numbers of functions, then we consider them up to equality. If we consider sets or groups or rings, we consider them up to isomorphism. And then if we go up in the categorical hierarchy in some sense, that becomes equivalence by equivalence and so on. Okay. So this equivalence principle is uh, something that is not enforced, but it's something that uh, the it's the mathematician's responsibility, a priori, a priori, to take care of not violating this principle. Okay, so we can violate this principle. For instance, we can find a statement about categories that is not invariant under this equivalence of categories. One such statement would be the statement about a category C having exactly one object. Okay, this is of course true for this category, but not for the equivalent one. Um, and so one might say, or a reasonable viewpoint on this statement is that it's a, a silly statement that is not, uh, should not be considered. So to put it with the words of Michael McKay, uh, the basic character of the principle of isomorphism, so he's talking about isomorphism uh, instead of uh, equivalence, is that of a constraint on the language of abstract mathematics. A welcome one, since it provides for the separation of sense from nonsense. Okay. So one might say one goal of this equivalence principle is to have a syntactic criterion for properties and constructions that are invariant under equivalence. Uh, if we stay with this example on the level of categories, we had this uh, statement that was not invariant. The category C has exactly one object. Um, where exactly does the non-invariance come from in this statement? It comes from the fact that we refer to equality of objects in a category in this statement. So we would like uh, to avoid talking about equality of objects in a category to, get to, to, to remain invariant. But one problem is that even a naive definition of category, like the definition of category that one usually gives, refers to equality of objects, namely in the definition of the composition of arrows. Two uh, arrows are composable only if uh, the source of the second one is uh, equal to the target of the first arrow. So a first task in order to get some kind of invariance uh, for, for, for categories is to give a definition of a category that does not refer to equality of objects. Okay. Um, one way to give such a definition is to work in a slightly in, in a more in a in a language where one can have dependent types or dependent collections. You will see what that is, where conditions on source and target of arrows can be encoded by what type of uh, thing f and g are. Um, what would this look like um, if I use such a language of dependent types? I, might, I can define a category as consisting of a collection O of objects. Here, that's just uh, uh, like in a, in a naive definition. But then I don't have one collection of arrows, but I have uh, for any two objects, for any pair of objects, I have a collection of arrows from X to Y. Okay. And then I can write a uh, composition, not as a partial binary function, but as a dependent function that only takes uh, compatible arrows f and g, where uh, f is an arrow that ends in y, and g is an arrow that starts in y. Okay? And in this way, the, let's say the compatibility of f and g are given by, by, by construction. Um, this gives rise to a language of to a dependently typed language, a language of dependent types or dependent collections, whatever. And we can add logical connectors on top of that, and then we get a language 
for doing category theory in, um, where compatibility, where conditions like this are encoded in, in this typing information. Okay. Um, that was discovered like long ago, and the theorem from the 70s is that a property of categories is invariant under equivalence if and only if it can be expressed in this dependently typed language that I have not really specified, using equality for arrows, but not for objects. So if I restrict my language in such a way that I have an equality predicate only for arrows, and only this means only for parallel arrows, um, then uh, I, get, I can only express properties that are invariant under equivalence of categories. OK, so this theorem is a theorem about properties of categories. It does not talk about constructions. Um, so what would be, so a, a property is invariant, of course, if it is true for one, if, it, if I have two equivalent categories, if it is true for one, if and only if it is true for the other. But we also, if we apply the same construction to two equivalent categories, we hope that the result will be, again, two equivalent things. So that would be a kind of generalization of this of this uh, result. And what, uh, what can we say about other mathematical structures? Okay. So these two questions, there is a partial answer to these two questions uh, in the univalent foundations. What are the univalent foundations? It's a, a new foundation of mathematics, an alternative to set theory. And it is exactly a language of dependent types, similar to what I've shown before, where we can have dependent collections or dependent types. And this, this syntax, this language, it has an interpretation in infinity groupoids or Kahn complexes. The basic syntactic objects are types and terms of a given type. And then we have functions between types that map terms of type A to terms of type B. And we think of these types uh, as uh, Kahn complexes. The objects of a given type are the objects of this Kahn complex, the zero objects. And well, functions are just maps of Kahn complexes. In these foundations, the sets are kind of a sub-universe of all possible types. So sets are given by those, uh, are by given by discrete uh, groupoids. And what is different, uh, one, one of the important differences between these foundations and classical set theoretic foundations is that properties and constructions are treated in a uniform manner in, in the univalent foundations. Um, the interpretation that I've just shown admits um, a certain property. We, there is a, one can prove an invariance result in the interpretation that one can then uh, add to the, to the syntax to make the following, uh, which then becomes the following axiom in the syntax. An equivalence of types lifts to an equivalence of all constructions on those types. So this is uh, an axiom, uh, the validity of which, or the in independence of which, was discovered by Wawotsky. And what is an equivalence of types? Uh, it's simply, it's more or less like an isomorphism of types, a bit more complicated. So a map F of types or of uh, infinity groupoids is an equivalence if there is a map in the other direction, such that if we go back and forth, we obtain uh, the same result up to isomorphism in the uh, infinity groupoid. And so what this axiom says is that all the constructions that I can, like all the properties or constructions that I can do in the univalent foundations are invariant under this notion of equivalence. Okay, this maybe is, a, is maybe difficult to appreciate, but what does it mean for mathematics? It has um, some interesting consequences. For instance, when you do group, group theory in univalent foundations, what is a group? A group in univalent foundations is just a type G that is, uh, uh, we need it to be a discrete type. So what we call a set, together with, uh, well, the usual operations, the group operations, such that the, the usual group axioms are satisfied. And then what happens is that 
um, these invariance result on types will lift to an invariance result on groups. So um, a group isomorphism between two groups G and G prime is a bijective function on the underlying types uh, that is compatible with the group structures on G and G prime. So this is the usual definition of a group isomorphism. And then we have that an isomorphism, we can, that's a, a theorem, one can prove that an isomorphism of groups lifts to an equivalence of all constructions on those groups in the univalent foundations. In particular, since constructions and uh, properties are kind of uh, the same thing in the univalent foundations, we obtain that any statement about groups that I can uh, express in the univalent foundations is invariant under group isomorphism. So I cannot express anything, I cannot say anything in univalent foundations that is not invariant under isomorphism of groups. And this is actually not true only for groups, but also for other kind of algebraic structures, like rings. Uh, if I express this a bit differently, I can say that in the categories of sets, groups, rings, etc., any construction expressible in the univalent foundations is invariant under isomorphism. What happens if we do not consider things that form categories, but things that form like uh, higher categories, like bicategories or something. Um, there's a, a similar theorem about, well, at least the bicategory of categories. In the bicategory of saturated categories, I will talk about that. Any construction in univalent foundations is invariant under equivalence. Um, so this is uh, an analogous result. Uh, as this, but for the appropriate notion of sameness, of uh, equivalence for objects of a bi-category. Um, so here, I don't talk about arbitrary categories, but only about saturated categories. This is a condition that I have to impose in order to make this uh, theorem true. Um, what is this condition? What does it say? It's a technical condition, but intuitively it says that in a saturated category, isomorphic objects are indistinguishable. Okay, So if I have two categories in which I cannot distinguish isomorphic objects, then I cannot really distinguish between the two equivalent categories. So in some sense, an equivalence principle on the objects of the categories lifts to an equivalence principle between the categories. Um, this is a non-saturated category. It has two objects that I can distinguish by giving them different colors or something. But they are isomorphic. So this is maybe the simplest non-saturated category. But many, cate many categories that I can define in the univalent foundations are actually saturated. For instance, those categories set, group, and ring. This is just what I've said before. And then there are certain closure properties, like the functor category is saturated if the target categor category is and so on. So one, and I'm at the end of my talk, one research goal maybe that I would like to work on this year is to generalize this saturation condition that we know how to express for categories to arbitrary structures, mathematical structures, higher categorical structures, given by uh, a general notion of signature, and then prove the equivalence principle for saturated such structures. Thanks.